Well, we're, we're I would live, say so. that was accurate, honey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sweetie. He's right. <laughs> All right, guys. We should be up on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. So okay. we'll just. Uh, oh, she we'll did have to call the parents, didn't she? I'm not sure. Uh, okay, looks like it Can I working. get a quick um, okay. a quick sound test from all you guys, one at a time? What, uh, I can Just start. One, tell me about two, your more. Three. What? Are it, you starting? It, it's fine, yeah, just whatever. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Nope, I can't do it. One, two, three. Now me, helicopter, chamber of commerce, beluga whale, lamp. No, that was a good sound test. Thank you. Thanks. Do we? Oh wow. Uh, the human that's torch. So, this is the order that will go in at the end, beginning too. Okay. okay. The human torch was denied a bank loan. And then Brian, please. The human torch was denied a bank loan. <laughs> One more time, please, Brian. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten, eleven, twelve. Got you. Thank you, and Amy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. All right. There we go. So uh, we're waiting on Mike Bryant. Um, I sent him the, the other link. Okay. And so I don't know what if you guys want me to... Should we kick her off or should we wait till till he joins? Uh, no, yeah, we can, no, we we can, can go start. Yeah, we got... Okay. okay. So Amy, we got, did, we you got just plenty join, of did you just join my watch party? Is that what you did? I tried, and then I decided to start it on my own. Okay. It but that was, was it mine, or was it wrong about everything that you joined? It didn't let me do a watch party again. Okay. Same thing. It didn't. It only, and then I went back out, Javier, sure. and started it, and then it did. It was the weirdest thing. I wasn't able to do it, and now I That's just the did. weirdest thing? Well, all right. Besides you. You're weird. You're weird. I was only able to share it from MSNBC Studios to the to Wrong About Everything. That was the only thing that let me do. So I don't know. It wouldn't. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, and Javier, you're the quarterback, right? I'm the quarterback, so it's going to be me, Lauren, then wh- whatever you guys want to go on. Whatever. Amy Brian. Amy Brian. All right, guys, let's kick her off. Have a good show. Thank you, sir. Support for Wrong About Everything comes from Minnesota's credit unions. Credit unions are locally based, member-owned financial cooperatives that return earnings to members through higher savings rates, lower loan rates, and reduced fees. Visit mncun.org for more information. And welcome back from our hiatus. I believe it's been three years since we uh, last talked to you all, or or maybe it was a week. I'm not sure. (laughs) I am DFL strategist and exhausted Democrat, Javier Morillo. I am a founder of Tramp Nation and, uh, and cautiously optimistic, Lauren Anderson. I am... Also not sleeping, Javier, uh, former Republican Senate Majority Leader, Amy Koch. I am GOP strategist and just wanted to stop. (laughs) Brian McDaniel. And we We are are wrong wrong about about everything. everything. For fuck's sake. Hashtag Um, soon. Be done. Oh my gosh. Please. Please. At this point, they're not like... They're, like the, I feel like the like the the remaining states are all just like you go first, you go first, because no one wants to no one no one wants to see what will happen when Trump's head explodes, and so like they're not calling they they called Arizona with less information that we now have for Pennsylvania. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah for sure, for and then sure. They for wouldn't sure. call Florida even though it was. It was uh, North Carolina has been in for like three I know, days, I know. and no one will call it. Uh, no, it's crazy. I yeah. know. It's, no, because he's so close, right? So it's two sixty four well, that well, Biden has I, officially. I, I don't know. That we're, we're not. I don't think we're getting into that oh, okay. fully quite yet. Um, but wow. welcome to the credit union studio. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, we haven't done that. And, and the credit union living rooms. Yep, exactly. Minnesota credit unions. If you don't bank with one, don't be a dick. Bank with one. Yeah. Actually, that's our slogan, not theirs. They can't have it. I was, I, theirs is, we're not dicks. Bank with a credit yeah, union. Yeah. Hey, I went to my credit union today. I think that's what it is. Smooth as silk, baby. What's the, what's See, the, that's you can tell it's not their slogan because they let in a dick. <laughs> How about credit unions? They've got your tranche. Yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. Well, Javier, Javier, I didn't go inside. Uh, COVID's super dangerous. Did you know that? <laughs> oh, are we are we all, are we are we switching positions on COVID now? Yeah. <laughs> what did I say? No, I said everything's cha- everything's different after the election, right? It's like super dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> we're in the underworld right now. <laughs> you're like, upside down. You guys are like, holy shit, you guys <laughs> disinfecting. Did you, did you guys know that? <laughs> did you hear about this COVID thing? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. I don't. I don't I think. Just... I, don't, I don't think you guys are taking this serious enough. <laughs> I, I'm so mad, but that is funny. Yeah. No, one thing. <laughs> I'm so mad. But one, one thing, like, this has been, like, physically, like, physically very hard for me as far as, like, sleeping, getting headaches, not feeling good going up to the election. And I think part of it was that in 2016, I knew it was going to happen. I was 100% wrong, but there was no stress associated with it because it was like, okay, Hillary's going to win and the Dem- you know, Republicans suck and Democrats are winning everything, whatever. Uh, but that's not what happened. But going into election night, I kind of expected the blue wave. And then this time I was kind of ex- expecting the blue wave again. Um, you know, and, you know, we'll get into the specifics of it. But but this has just been very – I, mean, I have found, like, physically, like – like ailed i i I feel i don't haven't felt well uh, you know in the in the week kind of leading up to the election and um it's not done yet so i I can never i can have pockets of oh yeah you know what the fog is lifted and then i'll read one thing and i'm like nope back in the abyss (laughs) it's funny that you bring up stress though brian because i feel like overarchingly like that's what everybody's talking about more than like everybody that i know is like how are you handling the unknown or the unknowables and some people are like just on their phones on every website doom scrolling like everything trying to get every bit of information that they can and other people are like ah you know i bopped out entirely like my strategy was it's too it's too stressful everything i need to know i'm going to be able to read about later on so on election night i just shut off all um all devices and put up a shelf. <laughs> oh. See, last last night I I went to I went to bed. I saw what the numbers are looking like in in, yeah. in uh, Georgia and Pennsylvania. I said to John Styles, "I'm like, we should go to bed early so that when we wake up in the morning, we wake up to really <laughs> like debate. Christmas morning. It'll come and, sooner if we go to sleep right and now." And then this morning he woke up, and I'm like, "It happened." It happened. <laughs> By the time I woke up, like we had leads everywhere. <laughs> well, I did. I did not sleep election night. I I stayed up till about four o'clock in the morning, and then I caught like you know an hour, and then Javier and I were on. Um, we were on uh, NPR at six. That was this week. I, I know that was. Oh it doesn't God. seem like it, right? It was a couple days ago. It was Wednesday. The longest that, week. That was, was Wednesday two days morning. ago. Wow. I liked your. I liked your. Um, Brian, I like that post that you had that your wife put together like a treats basket for you. Oh yeah. man, she is a saint. Yeah. He had like Twizzlers there's, and Cheetos. There's Twizzlers, Cheeto Puffs, because I puffs. definitely prefer the Puffs. The Puffs, um, yeah. And then um and then uh Reese's peanut butter cups, and then there was also Diet Coke, bourbon, and fireball. <laughs> uh, you do not deserve that woman. No, yeah, no, that's that's like some next level yeah. wife yeah. stuff. Right and here's there. the deal: like awesome. I said, well, I want partner. one next time, and partner. I know if I asked, she would give me one. Oh yeah, well, she's that. No, I, I mean, like that's like that's being a good partner. That's yeah. not just being a good spouse. That's being like yeah. someone who just knows your. Yeah, yeah, Jenny's awesome. And I got, like, and I got she the, knows that this is your like Super Bowl, and uh, that you're like I'm gonna just like wank off to these numbers all night, yeah. and so she's just gonna prepare you for it. So give me some Fireball. She and just like lets puffs. you go. Yep. So. She knows puffs. Well, but the uh, ne- yeah. the next day uh, there was a dead uh, disemboweled rabbit on our deck, and I took care of it, so I think we're even. So. 
You wow. think that's the same thing? Well, <laughs> that's not the same she, thing. Jenny's very appreciative. She didn't have to deal taking, with that. Taking a dead rabbit off your porch is like, is like, it's like something you have to do. She like put forethought oh, together yeah, yeah, all yeah. of oh, your favorite oh, yeah, treats yeah, yeah. But, you know, and made it beautiful. Sometimes you like the... scraped c- carcass off steps. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's well, not the same thing. But she, hey. I'm, I'm from the suburbs, man. That's outside my comfort zone. And you know he was super whiny the whole time, too. Like, ew, the, ew. And, yeah, and by I removed it, he means he called someone. No, she, no he got a shovel no, she and said, some gloves, some of those yellow no, ladies' gloves. Jen, put those no, on. Jenny goes, Jenny goes, should I call my dad? And I'm like, no, I'll do it. Yeah, I know he's whiny about it. So yeah. whiny. He's it, dressed like Gloris, like Kravitch, that's my neighbor. That's my, bo- that's my boy thing for the year. Yeah. Uh, well, hey, well, Lolo, guys, we have a new sponsor. We have a new sponsor. I, Do you want to hear? Tell us. Yeah, okay. Tell us. All right. So it's the Citizens League, Lolo. They are a bipartisan, statewide nonprofit. They are recognizing and celebrating everyday people who have stepped up, helped out, and made a difference in their community in 2020. So you can join the Citizens League. I think this is a great idea. You can join the Citizens League on November 19th for a live virtual event hosted by... Jenna Shortall of Care 11. Cool. Yeah. A friend, Ce- a friend of the program. Celebrating um, these Minnesota leaders nominated by people like you and you and you and you, oh, like listener. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you can go to citizensleague.org backslash MN Civic Leader. So citizensleague.org backslash MN Civic Leader to nominate your neighbors and consider supporting the Citizens League to help bridge political divides to create effective policy solutions that work for everyone. You can also go and nominate your favorite podcast that you're listening to right 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 now. now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and they didn't ask that to, to plug in that way, but I just think, you know. Makes sense. Might as well. It just might as well. It just right? makes We're sense. doing some good, I think. It's the clear choice. Well, and we are uh, waiting a little bit. We're having a little bit of a technical difficulty, but we're trying to get uh, Mike Bryant on from Bradshaw and Bryant. He's going to talk to us a little bit about some of the legal stuff that's going on uh, about the election. But uh, while we wait for Mike, I will read about his firm, Bradshaw and Bryant. Uh, their entire team of attorneys and staff is dedicated to providing the legal advice you need combined with the service and personal attention you deserve. If you have any questions about how they can assist you with a personal injury, wrongful death, or criminal defense matter, do not hesitate to contact them. Consultations are always free. Contact them at 800-770-7008 or at minnesotapersonalinjury.com and be sure to tell them that the gang at Wrong About Everything sent you. So, all right, well, let's just... I don't want a quarterback for you, Javier. No, maybe, maybe we yeah. should just launch into what we're doing and we can bounce over to Mike when he comes up. Well, so uh, one of the things that's been – so like, let me – did you guys watch the press conference last night, Trump's press conference? Oh, it was – Something. It was – It was wild. Yeah. I it watched was, it. You, you, you know did you watch it? You know it's a big deal if I even watched it. Because <laughs> I, was, I was intending to not watch it. And then, but then like, and I was just sort of doom scrolling. I've actually, I've actually been really Zen pretty much all week. And like on, cause on, on Tuesday, I got a little annoyed with like Democrats who are like losing their damn minds. And I'm like, you guys, we all knew going in that our votes were going to be counted second in yeah. the key States, because that's just the, like that. We just, we knew everyone chilled. The fuck out. Yeah. It was a little much. So I've actually been calm, but yesterday I was like, I was a little bit doom scrolly and, uh, and like the tweets about the speech about the press conference were, were like on an extra level of extra. It was like extra because people were like, "Oh my god, like what is he doing?" So like, yeah, what what did you what did you think, Lauren? <laughs> Watching. I well, I I so rarely watch the watch Trump do anything because he instantly makes me feel crazy and upset and like. I just can't help but screeching lies. But this was like, this was, I felt like, um, I don't know, man. Like listening to him talk, I felt like it was, um, to, to the fact that Twitter even put out a statement being like, these, the tweets that he's sending are, are, uh, you should fact check his tweets. Basically, I'm forgetting the label that they used. It just makes me feel like, um, the, it just goes, uh, it, the, that, 
his press conference proved what I've always thought about the president is that he does not represent any of the the otherly things that are attached to a presidency, like decorum, uh, stoicism, any kind of like um, leading leadership uh, that's that we recognize to be like safe and secure. And he like, he breaks everything apart as opposed to like knitting things together. Whereas like Biden's, I felt like Biden's speech was like, stay calm, everybody. Democracy can get messy. You know what I mean? Well, and everybody's calm while they're winning. Uh, you know, it, well, I mean, I mean, I mean <laughs> although at that point he was actually down in the count in pretty much all the states, except maybe Nevada. Well, but was even, that was on the first night. That was on, that was on, on the first night. night. No, she's on, on the she's first night. He's, he's down. Last. But like we felt good and you, but, uh, but yeah, so let's get some legal analysis of last. Yeah. Well, cause there's, there's some lawsuits crazy crazy popping. Sounds crazy of... to even ask for legal analysis of last of the claims the president was making last night, but, but we're going to have to, um, cause, cause he made lots of claims and there've been lots of lawsuits. Uh, uh, so welcome to back to the show, Michael Bryant, Mike. How are you doing today? Hi, Mike. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> ah, so. Let's see where do where do we even start? So, uh, t- um, so so tell us about uh, I don't know just any of the there have been so many legal cases uh, filed this week. Uh, some of them bounced out very quickly, others are still pending. Um, what has stood out to you in the challenges uh, and and resolutions that you've seen so far? Well, it's not unusual to argue different sides um, in a, a brief or sometimes in the case, but I don't know that I've ever seen this drastic of a count these votes, don't count those votes, do this, don't do that. Um, you know, and then also they've got issues with senators um, and other house races that they've got that they want to win. So they want those votes. And uh, at the same time, they've got someone trying to throw out every possible race they possibly can. And um, it's, it's weird. I mean, it seems like the numbers are getting big enough pretty much everywhere and the lead's big enough that it kind of doesn't matter. And he might reach a point where, you know, most politicians would look at it and say, for the good of the country, um, you know, I think it's all COVID's fault and blah, 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 and I'm done. Now, I don't know that he'll do that. Um, He has a long history of litigation. He's tried, he's sued lots of people many, many times. Um, He's also got a history of losing a lot of litigation. So um, I think he's going to lose a lot of these challenges. And uh, he loves to go to court. I mean, it's amazing for a guy who seems to really not like lawyers. He loves to go to court. So yeah. I read the exchange between the judge and uh, and one of their the Trump campaign attorneys in, in Philadelphia, uh, in Pennsylvania, where they were they were alleging that Republican challengers were not being allowed to 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 observe to observe. Yes. And the judge That's asked him, "Do you are, do you have representatives in there?" And he he answered, "We have a non-zero number of representatives." Yep. Yeah, there's been some very odd questions um, and very odd answers about some of the things that that um, have happened. There's also some some of the arguments. I mean, all of you have been around elections your whole life. How would you know who to give a Sharpie to and who to give a pencil to? I mean, yeah. are they showing up with with their in their head? Who you're paying, you know? And which, I mean, what are you referring to there? There's the, the there's Arizona, there. Arizona, Arizona, because Arizona is claiming that a whole group of people got sharpies, and so their votes weren't any good because they wrote on them with sharpies because of some a violation. And I, I I don't know anybody that knows the vote that well that knows how to hand out you know pencils and sharpies. You know, it's it's like you know maybe. Maybe they ask them to line well, up how they're going to vote first. Well, and Mike, you know, and I, I've been involved in, you know, in in recounts before, certainly yep. nothing at the presidential level. Um, so I know that, you know, everyone everyone comes in with their theories and I'm, I'm fully supportive of the president. You know, if there's something to litigate, let's litigate it. Let's make sure everything's right. He has that right. I believe that if everything was, was flipped, the Democrats certainly would exercise whatever legal rights they have. But one of the things that this kind of is along the lines of what you're saying about is like, how do they know who to give the Sharpie to? It's like if the Democrats were so smart that they found out how to 
how to do fraud to get rid of Trump. Why couldn't they have done a better job of like winning the Senate or, you know, winning right. the Minnesota Senate? How do they know just to screw Trump, uh, but not then put themselves in better positions um, for the Senate? Now they still could win the U S Senate, but it's less likely than more. Um, so that's one of the things that makes me think, okay, you know, you know, if all of a sudden, Every Democrat won every race by large margins in in areas where they normally don't win. Well, then maybe we kind of give it the side eye. But if it's yep. just that one guy is having trouble, but other people aren't, I'm certainly less likely to buy into you know a, a conspiracy theory. But that's what the courts are there for. Figure it out. Yep. And, and and there's a right to fight. I mean, it's it's not saying you can't fight certain things. And I've been involved in two recounts, and and it's it's crazy when you actually look at ballots on how people vote. They do some weird stuff. They do <laughs> do know, weird do stuff. stuff. I was involved with the Coleman <laughs> recount, and it is some strange stuff. And also, by the way, this is historically close. Let us not. I mean, this this is coming down to thousands of votes in these. I think I saw what was which one is it that's up two thousand votes or something. I mean, it is just ridiculously close in these well, states. So I think that down. either side was but going to make some challenges. I, I don't. I, I, I don't know because I would suggest and I, uh, give you. I'll be just a second, Lauren. But I, I, if if the votes would have come in like normal. If they had vote, if they in those states had counted Pennsylvania the way they would count it normally, if they had counted um, Georgia the way they did normally, I think this would have been shutting down. I mean, people in the West would have looked at it and said, "It's over. Biden's won this thing. Uh, it's over." And he he won by four million votes, or he's winning by four million. Yeah, votes in the overall. popular vote, but not in these states. These states are well, within thousands. That, that's what matters. Real, those are votes that came in and if they came in like normal and Pennsylvania's called it earlier in the night or Georgia looks like it's going earlier in the night and those it's there's a certain weirdness about the way the votes were counted and they were done that actually kept this thing probably closer than it is and in the end I think we're going to look at this and think Biden won this thing huge Votes that came in in. and if they came in like normal and Pennsylvania's called it earlier in the night awesome do we get okay. some feedback there? No, it's not. Okay. Lauren, Lauren, you go. Ghost, Ghost Bryant. Um, <laughs> I, I have a question about who's paying for it. So, like, oh. I know that recounts <laughs> cost money, and but if like if Trump like brings all these cases forward that he alleges, then like who's paying for that? And then is there a way that the taxpayers can be like, no way, man? Because like I think that like I was thinking about like potential recount for Wisconsin and whatnot, and like and how even some Republican leaders were like, don't bother. Last time we did a recount, Scott it Walker. just cost the taxpayers money, and it was so and it was the exact same count. And I thought that was fascinating that Republicans themselves would be like, don't bother with the recount. Well, and so with all these like legal stuff, like who is paying for this these su- it, these suits? It I depends guess. on the law. Yeah, right. It depends, it depends on, on which just each by state decides there's a threshold for recount. Right. But there's okay. uh, campaigns get uh, get caught for they end up paying for some of it. Um, okay. If it's an automatic recount by the numbers, then it's it's there. But if there's a um, if there's lawsuits that take place, you're supposed to pay for it as part of the campaign. And apparently uh, Trump's been fundraising off that. But it still uses the court system and it still uses people in the court system. And right. he seems to use, use uh, private or public lawyers like they're private lawyers. And so there is a taxpayer funding to it. Um, I don't know if you guys talked about this earlier, but boy, you look at what happened in Wisconsin compared to here. He should have gone to Wisconsin three or four more times in state. And the people who convinced him to come here are absolutely wrong. Well, he he, he, gone to Wisconsin. he insisted on coming to Minnesota. It was him. Well, he had a real burrow his, under his saddle after 16 because he got within 40,000 votes in Minnesota and he only came here once. And so he threw down the gauntlet afterwards. And in, even in 18, I heard about it because I was uh, running the U.S. Senate race for Karen Housley. And we would hear all the time, the president is so frustrated that he got that close to Minnesota and didn't, you know, didn't get over the line. So I think everything I heard is from his folks like at the campaign, we're saying, let's just 
let's leave Minnesota. Let's focus on these. And he was insistent that he, he could get Minnesota. Minnesota. He Isn't that so it. funny, though? I feel like that's totally ego-driven, right? Like, like Minnesota has constantly yeah. served up blue for its presidential races, like, for years and years and years. And the fact that he came that close, it's just like, he's just, like, so limp-dicked about it. That he's like, I'm going to waste my I'm going to waste my campaign funds and come back to Minnesota. Well, one thing, one thing I but would I say, I'm oh, sorry, you go, Mike. He, I think he had people around him, though. I mean, some of this is the idea that towards a governor race in two years. And so there's people who are very close to him that are advising him about coming here. Um, and they were wrong about it. Well, one thing I one thing I would say, you know, so for, for people who say, oh, he should have gone to Wisconsin, you know, as a Minnesota Republican, yeah, you know, even though he didn't win here and even though Jason Lewis That's didn't true. win here, he absolutely, you know, provided an infrastructure in Minnesota mm -hmm. that our state – Republican Party just doesn't have. So I'm appreciative of it, not for any kind of Trump reason, but because he helped out, you know, you know, the Republicans, we, we, we held the Senate um, in Minnesota. We gained picked seats in the House. And that picked up a would, congressional seat. Picked up a congressional seat, um, kept one in the first that, you know, maybe we shouldn't have. I don't know. But, um, you know, the infrastructure that he provided, you know, is beneficial to Republicans. Now, for his own, what Mike's talking about, for his own benefit, Maybe he should have been spent more time in Wisconsin. You know, he, he fell into the Hillary trap. Uh, although, there he is. well, that and also, if you looked at the polls at the end, the averages were it was better here in Minnesota. Um, but can we talk about that too? Because like the polls again, I mean, like it's going to be interesting to compare. I I just don't know what's going to happen with the methodology there. They're going to have to come up with some stuff that's a little more based in reality. What was the final? Was did Biden win by nine points in Minnesota? I think it was eight. Eight? Eight? Eight, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah eight. Yeah. And, and very interesting that Republicans, Minnesota went back to our ticket split in ways because yeah. there were yeah. many, many districts, uh, like in the state Senate and the state House, that uh, the the Minnesota Republicans, you know, out, not many, but several where they outperformed. Um, so do we remain the, the only split yes. legislation yep. in the country? Still yes. the only one. Yep, still the only and one. Basically, nuts. most legislators stay the same. I think that's a nuts same. idea. Like, yeah. I That's thought crazy. we'd be able to turn it, but here we go again. Close. We'll, we'll talk, we'll talk about that in Minnesota for sure, the yeah. Minnesota section, because there's a lot to, lot to unpack there. So where are we timing-wise with some of these races? Are the ones that, that – because I know that – is Georgia now saying that they're going to have to recount – and then yeah, are, are, are the major are the major within the margin of error? Yeah, yeah. that's, uh, the margin, that's the automatic. Margin are the major Georgia. legal battles now Arizona and Pennsylvania? Is that kind of what we're? Not, I don't want to say down to, but those are the are those the major ones we're looking at, Mike? Yeah, I, I believe so. I mean, Nevada is is open. They're still counting votes till the eighth. And that's something they had for a rule. Um, and uh, so I, depending on where Nevada ends up, Nevada is probably going to gonna see its li own litigation. Um, there's been litigation started in Wisconsin and, and Michigan. Um, and um, I doubt there, that, yeah, there wouldn't be in North Carolina. So um, what was I going to say? Shoot. Uh, one, one thing I think legally is important to, to realize is that different states have different rules. Yep, and a lot, I think a lot of people are saying, well, what's, you know, I thought it was this. I thought it was this. Well, you know, Pennsylvania gets to decide their rules yep. and we can decide. Like, I think Pennsylvania rules are really bad, but it ain't up to me. It's up to Pennsylvania. And if you want to know why they're not counting their votes early, it's because our legislature lets us do it. Their legislature right. didn't. So this isn't all, well, those idiots in Pennsylvania. Well, they might be idiots, but they're just following law, and it's state law, not federal law. And it's different in Minnesota, different in Nevada, different in all these different states. And it's not right. perfect for us who just want kind of, you know, we want an instant answer. But – it's not going to change. There's not going to be a federal. Right. Standard. I mean, it's not just not just as the law and a lot, but it, but in those states, it's Republican le legislatures that specifically were like were asked by their secretaries of state, um, to, you know, because of COVID and that because we knew we knew for we've known for a long time that there would be more absentee ballots, that like this was done 
so for this very reason, like and just like Donald Trump has been saying all the summer long, you know, don't trust absentee ballots, don't don't trust uh, mail in ballots, and so like it's it was designed to create this chaos. It's just that the numbers have been overwhel- like uh, are overwhelming as they're counting, and there's a limited amount to what they, they could do. They can't shut down counting, but they certainly intended to. Well, so I think that that is Mike. Like I think that was a calculated mistake on the Republicans' part. Um, that idea that they were going to sort of make enemies of the mail-in ballot. Um, and I talked about this. I was actually very proud of myself. I was in August. I was telling Reuters that, hey, here's the risk that you get a surge in November, end of October, November. Here we are. Uh, and you have been saying all along, don't don't vote absentee. Don't do mail-in. Or you've been at least, you know, adding doubt to this. And, and for a very long time, the president was you know, making an enemy of the mail-in ballot. And now what we're seeing coming to come home to roost is the mail-in ballot. And then everybody's like, well, why are the mail-in ballots so Democrat? Well, because, you know, a lot of Republicans with a very big megaphone, the president was telling us they were wrong, they were bad, or they were were not to be trusted. Yep. Although I think if you're in Pennsylvania and you're a Republican legislator, you're probably glad the votes have come in the way they did. You know, and the the words came in the way they did. And and I, I believe if you're a Republican in the West, you're happy that Pennsylvania didn't come in earlier. Yeah. That's the thing too, is that as much as as much as you know, like when I talk to, you know, friends and family who aren't in politics, as much as they want to focus on, you know, the president or the Supreme Court, it's a very different story when you talk about state by state. Because in Minnesota, <laughs> to me, Retaining divided government going into redistricting is so much more important to me than who the president is. And, you know, the Supreme Court's important. But but nope. but I mean, people don't focus enough on local stuff. It's just the, the, the you know, the shiny object uh, in D.C. A, a lot of stuff happened in Minnesota that, that was very important. And those votes mattered to me as much, if not more, than anything happening on the federal level. Nope. Redistricting had a big effect on Congress. Yep. Um, there were seats that were picked up because of some redistricting that were done. Um, oh, North and, Carolina. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then the other the other thing about it is most people who start talking about wanting to change this and change that, it's like, well, that would be getting rid of the electoral college, really. I mean, you know, because what you just said right there is, why can't we just all count the votes and whatever the total is, just do it. That's just. The electoral college. I mean, that's that's the basis for states' rights. Is yeah. states get to choose how they do it, and if you want to do it, and you want to stay up until till November eighth to count ballots, that's that's what your right is, you know. And that's you know they have a basis for that. I mean, they wanted to make sure military votes got in, you know, and they were sent over from from you know when people were in war, and they wanted to make sure they came in and stuff, and that makes sense. And I don't know. I I believe in getting every possible vote in. You you people want to vote. They should get the chance to vote. And that's what's important. And it's great to see the numbers in Minnesota just for the number of people who voted. Because you know I there was a point on Tuesday night where I thought you know if the majority of people want want tr- Donald Trump, well then that's the world we're going to live in. Well, I'm going to you know? I'm going to quote I'm going to quote one of our listeners. So I hope this isn't wrong, but I think he said th- that both Trump and Biden got more votes than Obama did in 08 yeah. um yeah. and that's that's really? that's a credit to everybody because yes mm-hmm. in minnesota we know what it's like to have these amazingly high voter totals when i worked for the for the house of representatives you know whenever someone would talk about well it's a good idea to you know try to get lower vote lower turnout in minnesota you can't you can't arrange for low voter turnout it doesn't happen here and thus that uh, we don't do that we don't it's not it's not a main part of what we do but um so many people voted and and part of it was because there was on both sides, you know, a, a push for the for for the mail and stuff. I think ultimately, you know, I don't like that because it's not the post office's job; it's the state, secretary of state's job. But ultimately, more voter participation is good, and it's mm-hmm. not always something that's going to benefit your guy or or your candidate or whatever it might be. <laughs> but but there's no argument that lower participation is a good thing. Yeah. I'll, so Mike, I'll just point Mike out just, that Wright County had the uh, top amount of votes again. We went 61% for Trump, 94.3% turnout. Wright County. Nice. Says, Woo! says the woman who lives in Ramsey County. That yeah. is, uh, no, you can take the aim. But, uh, I, I mean, everybody here knows. <laughs> I mean, you lose elections. I mean, everybody here has sat through those losses, yeah. and it's yeah. hard. You know, yeah. and and but you want people to vote, and if people vote the other way, you figure out ways to deal with that. 
So you, so uh, just to to wrap up with you, Mike. The the in terms of the legal challenges, uh, you, know, th- you know, there are as you said, you know, said at the beginning, you know, it's some um, competing arguments for different states. But are there any of the legal challenges that you've that you've seen that like that will that you think you know have have any more merit or might act or might hold things up in any in in any way? Because from what I've seen up to now, things have been like bounced out pretty quickly, or the the arguments are sort of along the lines of count these, but don't count these. But yeah. is the, am I missing something? They seem to be lining up in a, in a bad position. I mean, the, the people running things in Arizona, the people running things in, in Pennsylvania are, are Republicans for the most part. And, and um, the system that they did it with was Republican legislatures. Um, so, you know, I don't know that attacks on the rules are going to work. If there's stories or if there's some way they can prove that, you know, somehow there was somebody that was not in there um, that should have been in there. Yeah. That, that if it's allowed, it should be allowed. And if it's not, then, you know, they're not going to go any place. Um, um, so, so I, I think there's a couple of things that'll come up, but I think, again, it's going to come down to if this thing ends up as big as it looks like it might, I mean, it looks like Biden might end up with the same total electoral votes that Trump had uh, yeah. four years ago. And if he has that many, it, it some of it's going to be like, so what, you know, I don't think it'll matter. So, and they'll yeah. have to, I mean, they're going to have to bring some proofs. Uh, Senator Ben Sass called on the president to, if he has, what did he say? He said, if he has, he must present real evidence of voter fraud um, to provide backup um, to repeated claims of fraud in a number of key swing states. I mean, if yeah. they're going to win anything, right, they're going to absolutely have to bring forth. We, I've been hearing a lot on my Twitter feed, on my Facebook feed. I've even had like some sort of great like videos that like, hey, watch this. This is, proves it. Um, but I just like they're eventually they're going to have to come to the courts with. Well, uh, I, I, I more saw than I, I saw on the Twitter that that some postal per, some postal authority from Pennsylvania is going to come forward with proof that they backdated ballots. OK. Yeah. All right. I want to see it. Come on yep. down. Yep. I, yep. I, I am. What, what, what was it? What was it um, from uh, um, X-Files? Something like I'm ready to believe you. Yes. I'm ready to believe you. Just show it to me. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I, I got a check yeah, was, I'll write a check. Yeah. Just show me. Show me it, and I'm on your side. Yep. There was video that supposedly showed ballots being destroyed in Michigan, and then the news station was like, that was actually our cameraman, like, putting <laughs> away his stuff in the in the, in the the parking garage like that. Like, yeah, I uh, it, it's... You know, um, that cameraman was Ilhan Omar. <laughs> I mean, it'll be it'll be interesting, right? That because the like it is interesting already, sort of which Republicans are speaking up at all and which are which are not. And you know, Mitt Romney has said that the president, you know, what that his speech last night was inappropriate. Driver. Michelle Fishbach, Congresswoman elect from the seventh district, has gone full bananas and is <laughs> saying the same thing as as uh, uh, uh is parroting um I, there was a, a a reporter i guess got a, a hold of uh the conference call that the chair, state party chair jen carnahan did the, like where they were imploring republican elected officials to stand up and and speak up and uh and, and support the president on um on, on this and so it'll it's the the so far i see on the like speaking up for the president like lindsey graham Shocker, um, and uh, and I think Tuberville, the senator elect, and yep. then Fishbach, um, not many others. Honestly, that's been kind of it on a national well, stage. And, 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 a lot of and, quiet. A, a quick question. A, quiet. a quick question for for Mike and Amy though is refresh my memory. I, and Mike, I don't I don't know. Did you work on Franken Coleman at all? Yeah, okay, because I, I was at Locker Trindle now and then, so we actually were were part of the uh, the Franken team, though I didn't work on that. Uh, per- refresh my memory. At the end of the night, before was was Franken up or was Coleman, Coleman up? Coleman, Coleman up was, was up. three yeah. three recounts. Coleman was up. So two recounts or three, and the fourth recount, then Franken was up. Ooh, all right. Oh yeah, it's <laughs> amazing. I even, I blanked all that out. <laughs> oh, that was a big they- deal. Like Coleman won the end of the night. Coleman won the first recount, and I, at least the second one, and then yeah, then and the, again. Until all the ballots are counted, this is like there is no one's leading. But these were that's, what, that's what's happened recounts. this week. It's to Mike's <laughs> point earlier that if they had counted these ballots in order that they came in, which uh, state like many states did, like um, we, it would have we would have had a different different night. I mean, Democrats wouldn't have been walking around like zomb- like depressed zombies all week. Yeah. Like, it, I, I still think if Georgia would have looked close on election night, you know, actually at 
eight o'clock or eight thirty, it would have been a whole different story across the country. You know, yeah. and, uh, you and know, Pennsylvania and, had been had been scanning votes for weeks yep. in advance, like Florida had been. We would have known Pennsylvania uh, then and we would have known, then. So then we would have known that he had very few, that Trump had very few paths. It's the first yeah. time on this show in a very, very, very long time we, that we have were kind of like, hey, everybody look at Florida, do what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what we do here they really did I wrap up quickly yeah. they really yeah. did wrap well, up jeb, quickly jeb really, said yeah we changed the law yeah yeah jeb said yeah. We changed florida. The law. we've been proud of florida for anything yeah. Yeah. exactly florida man is confused yeah florida, <laughs> florida man got florida. his shit done <laughs> yeah <laughs> said well no one thanks ever. mike we appreciate you coming on the show mike, and everyone great. bradshaw and bryant yeah mike well, remind, remind everybody where they can find you um, minnesotapersonalinjury.com or call 800-770-7008. Well, thanks a ton. Right. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, man. So they, uh, what have, uh, let's see. So, so we still, so there, there are going to be two Georgia runoffs. Yeah. Yes. Um, so for uh, listeners, that's if they get 50%. For Senate. Yeah, for U.S. Senate. US Senate, Senate. US Senate. Under 50%. Yep. And uh, David Perdue, as last I time checked, was 498 So he is just, he's fallen under the 50% mark, and there will be a runoff there. Yeah. That's a weird thing that they do in Georgia. I don't know. Uh, yeah, Louisiana and, does it, too, and California, I think, just started doing that. You know what I think is interesting? Well, like, obviously, I wanted to double check and read up what a runoff was. Um, but I so when I was reading up about it, I was thinking, like, I think it's so fascinating that the point of like a reelection is that they remove some of the extraneous people from the ballot and they just they just put the two on the two people that were cl close enough within the margin of error. And for some reason, a lot of times when you when they clean up that ballot, it causes like somebody to take a clear majority. It's like if you take some, it's like, um, it's like that teaching concept where you limit the options to kind of free up your mind. So it's like, it's like, well, these are the two clear front runners. And so we're just going to present a sheet of paper or whatnot with two names on it this time and see if that fixes anything or like presents a clear majority. I thought that was fascinating, like psychologically, like that we would have to go through something like that. Like people wouldn't just know, you know, well, it's essentially great. Ranked choice voting just done over two primaries. Yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah I was exactly. Just, I was just saying, and also, uh, State Representative uh, Ray Dean uh, correctly wants to make sure we're clarifying the difference between a re-canvas and a recount. Yeah, what is a, yes. what is the difference? So re-canvas. So there's a recount is an official process that like starts everything over. They like so what happens now is like and there's always there's always a re-canvas of results. Yeah. Um. Like so they they just check everything, but that but you're not actually going ballot by ballot like yeah. that. Like you're just re-canvassing totals that you're getting from all the the counties. Yeah. A recount you're actually doing the whole thing over, and it's a in Minnesota it, the per, there's there's an automatic recount if it falls below 0.1%. Is that point, right? I want to say 0.05%, but I, yeah, boy, yeah, if some I listener know. knows it's, for sure, it's, there's, and it's, there's, right, it's, just like Georgia, it triggers an automatic if it's specifically if this it's below a certain amount. And I think there's a, then there's an amount where you get, where the, where they can, Pay to have yeah, it. Yeah, the candidate can, can, can request one and then they have to pay for it. But and they have to pay as for Scott it. Walker pointed out on Wisconsin, recounts are really hard to pick up votes, at, like any kind of yeah. substantial vote. Yeah. So if you're down, um, like somebody was talking to me about, Senator Carla Nelson was down in Rochester, 904 votes. And they're like, well, we got to see, we got to see, well, maybe a up. recount. Oh, I'm up. sorry, she was up. up I'm so sorry, Carla. Yeah. Senator Nelson, you were up over 900 votes. Um, it, it just, you're not going to. You're not going to overcome a 900 vote deficit now, in a in a revote. As, as, as much not as not in a Senate race, as much as Minnesota deficit. is known for, we have pretty good elections here and 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 all that. Um, you know, elections are run by counties. I mean, that's one thing we do. We you know, people who as much as some people want to blame the feds for stuff and they want and they want to blame the state of Minnesota for stuff, it's the counties that run the elections. So I'm in Dakota County, Dakota County, and not to you know besmirch them but there were all kinds of like weird it's screwed up yeah, yeah i mean there's i mean and, and and that is 
psychologically hard on people yeah. like us. Maybe regular people weren't following it close enough. But, I mean, Dakota County, they had me practically vomiting because it, it, <laughs> I, they're telling you that 100% of the results are in and yeah. your guy's up. And then you just look at the numbers and go, I know that's not right. Right. They have like 6,000 votes in a state house race. And you're like, that can't, you can with 100% in, and you're like, no, yeah. that's not right. That was that's Carla, right. Senator Carla Bigham. Front of the program, yeah. uh, like so, she's a Democrat in um, uh, Cod- like Cottage, Cottage Grove, Grove, Cottage, South Grove, St. Cottage Paul. Grove, yeah. And so, at one point in the evening, it showed her like 100 percent reporting and like lost, like oh yeah, multiple uh, Apple Valley. Senator Clausen was down. Well, in Apple Valley, all the Republicans this, were up in all House, three races. Yeah, and you know, I had people like. Yo, know, text me, oh my God, we want this and this. And I'm like, hold on. There's, 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 no, way, there's, there's something no way these numbers are right. In Dakota County. Yeah. 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 But, and those, they had, they had not counted the, which was weird because I, I think in Minnesota generally, like we count those together, but for some reason they had not counted the absentee. Right. So they were basically reporting the results the same of same day. Well, and I, yeah. And I or some mail in ballots and yeah, some. Yeah. And I didn't have a problem day. with them doing it in whatever order they want to do it, but then don't say 100% of the precincts <laughs> right. are in because that's not true exactly that that was the thing i was didn't understand the, the percentage precinct like stop just get rid of that percentage or whatever because yeah. there was a good number of them and there are still actually ones that have reported as 100 percent that we know they still have like outstanding a few hundred ballots now, now what i don't know is because i didn't go on to the actual dakota county website until late um it was the secretary of state's website that that i was looking at most of the night so i don't know for all i know the dakota county website didn't say you know 14 of 14 right. reporting i don't know that but whatever was going on um it certainly gave a lot of candidates a lot of stress probably a lot of constituents <laughs> a lot of stress it gave big time bry here um you know all kinds of stomach problems and Brian, uh, i'm sorry they did yeah, that to i you. know hey guess guess what else minnesota news the big news in minnesota what Mike Franklin won. Jordan Mike Franklin, Mayor. yeah. He unseated the incumbent mayor, Valashek, Tanya yep. Valashek. It was a, uh, it was a, it was a real fight to the finish, and it is now going to be mayor elect Franklin. Ghost of, is the mayor elect ghost of Mike Franklin today for like the first time ever. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. So yes, he's the progressive mayor of Jordan. <laughs> I don't think wearing a suit in Jordan is exactly how you relate to the people. Amy, Amy, Amy and I were there, mayor, last... but he said that. Yeah, Amy and I were Amy, Amy and I were there last week. Yep, we yeah. were door knocking yeah. for him. We, we, so we put that friend over the, the top. Also, friend of the program and one time sub, and probably won't be able to do it again. But uh, Emma Greenman, uh, state representative elect Emma Greenman, another yeah. winner. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You you know her. She comes on. She's a lawyer, Emma, and she's also the lawyer to the Otter. Um, She's a pers- personal lawyer to the only, otter. Only I assume in, she'll stop that now, head. too. Yes, but yes. <laughs> yeah. He bounces um, legal opinion. He bounces legal situations off of her. <laughs> but we're, we're, we're jumping ahead a little bit, but I just okay. wanted to yeah. ask just a little bit about to, sort of just uh, general takes on uh, on the night, right? Because I think that it's been a confusing week. I, I absolutely agree with my Bryant that that psychologically the week would have been very different if the, if people had, if all states had counted at the same time mm-hmm. um but but i but this week has been interesting as a democrat watching like there, as there were moments where i've just been like Hi, it's like people you cannot take yes or an answer like it and from my perspective <laughs> i thought like that yes we were hoping for a sweep but and and um but when i i like so when you have a person in power who spends four years breaking norms and is a strong man figure like that has that changes society. It has an impact on society. It it does, you know, and it changed the it changed the he changed the electorate without a doubt. And so right now, it's not actually that dissimilar to what happened in twenty eighteen. Like our turnout, like Republican turnout in twenty eighteen was through the roof. It's just that Democratic turnout was also through the roof, but even more so. Yeah, right? no, Dave, Republicans are about eighty three percent of the turnout of presidential turnout, which is a lot in a midterm. Eighty three percent of your presidential turnout, crazy numbers for Republicans. A hundred percent of the presidential turnout in twenty eighteen compared to twenty sixteen for the Democrats. I mean, you guys just really turned out. Right. So, and I saw some th- someone say on uh, it was someone on Twitter, but I uh, I thought it was it was astute for that that in some ways you know d- like Donald Trump has brought out irregular and first time, especially white non-college educated voters. And that, um, 
that 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 it it was sort of the best of bo- a lot of worlds for Republicans in the legislature and in, in the in Congress who did not love Trump, um, even if they were just quiet about their criticisms, because he turned out people who then turned who also voted for Republicans, um, and and enough ticket splitters clearly right that yeah, that, well, that we... like or or Republican leaning independent people independents we knew that going in that Biden was winning independents. But but independents who normally tend to be more the ones who tend to be more Republican, some independents tend to be more Democrat, like probably just, you know, may have been voting for Biden, but then voted for their local Republican member of Congress. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Like in the state Senate. So there's kind of like four five top races, right? Senator Limmer up in Maple Grove, Senator Hall in Burnsville, Senator Jerry Ralph in St. Cloud, Senator Carla Nelson in Rochester. Oh, Senator Senjum in Rochester as well, um, which was interesting. And then Senator Housley, uh, a friend of the program out in Stillwater. And of those, um, I mean, the spending was, I've never seen anything like it in a state Senate race, millions of dollars spent on the left uh, from like all over the country. So you guys really had an eye on the state Senate and flip of the state Senate. Um, these districts were just, I've never seen so much money spent. Um, and I'd be interested with the final totals, but the October 20th totals were over a million dollars, which just doesn't happen in Minnesota. Uh, but it did happen in this case. Anyway, um, of those th- five, three, um, came out. We lost uh, Senator Dan Hall lost and Burnsville and Senator Jerry Ralph lost. Um, but they significantly, every single one of them um, significantly outperformed uh, Donald Trump and the Democrat significantly underperformed Biden. So Biden, I mean, is that part of like Biden's argument that I could win in certain in places where other Democrats couldn't? Is that what that's saying? Is that what happened in Pennsylvania? He could actually win in certain parts of Pennsylvania and Ohio that other Democrat candidates couldn't? Well, it, you know, it's interesting because yesterday there was a call with uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi and the, and the Democratic caucus. And there are some of the moderate members of the caucus who are, who are saying that this is the fault of the progressives and people saying things like abolish uh, you know, or defund the police and uh, yada, yada. Um, and um, and that that's the conversation on, on our side. I think... Uh, I, if I am Biden, the, uh, one of the people who is making the case from the beginning that Biden's the right candidate, I'd be feeling sitting pretty right now, right? That's what I'm because, saying, yeah. Because, like, you know, it may, like, people may not like this. I was an Elizabeth Warren person, but it, you know, it may be that, like, their theory of the case that he was the one candidate who could beat Trump is true. Well, uh, sorry. No, sorry. You go. No, go on. I don't, I don't, I don't. I was just thinking, like, it's it's fascinating to me because, you know, a, a, a while ago we were talking about this, like, the interim priest, you know, that you bring in. And I think Biden kind of fulfills this, like, exact, this this kind of, um, this hard to define kind of characteristic. Like, he is, he, is, he is the sanity that I think the country is collectively craving, but he's, he's uh, you know, moderate enough that he can, like, swing states that weren't, uh, were not previously swingable. And so I think I think the way he did show up was was way different. Like everybody that was like uber progressive conceded for Biden because he's a better choice for them than Trump. And everybody that was like, I am a Republican and I can't stand this Trump guy because of what he's doing to the country might concede to Biden because he's a more moderate choice or at least a choice for more decorum. Than, um, than what Trump brings to the table. Well, so I, think, I could, you know. I think the Trump-Biden thing really did come down to kind of like, you know, cults of personality. Um, because in a lot of other ways, and, and jump in and tell me you know, if I'm wrong, Republicans largely didn't fix their suburban problem. They didn't Mm-mm. fix. They didn't fix their woman problem. Uh, Democrats didn't necessarily figure out messaging to ex-urban or rural areas. That didn't happen. I mean, maybe in other states it was a little different. But what I saw here was nobody kind of learned, or at least if they, they certainly didn't fi- figure out a way to implement that. Um, I think that you know, I think that uh, that Lolo is 100 percent correct earlier in the show when she talked about that Minnesota might have been a vanity project um, for Trump. But then I also look at. Uh, what two hundred million dollars were spent trying to get rid of cocaine, Mitch, and um, and uh, and uh, <laughs> Lindsey Graham, and that two hundred million dollars one could have 
fed and clothed a lot of people, but it also probably could have elected a lot more Democrats in other places too. So I think that that uh, some of the some of the the more consistent problems that Republicans and Democrats have uh, still existed, and we didn't learn everything. And frankly, I want pollsters and the TV mm-hmm. networks to come out and not just say, "Oh, blah blah blah." I want them to say, "You know what?" We need to figure out what we're doing because what we're doing is wrong. Yeah, they never do. They always talk about tweaking around the edges or they'll say, well, we didn't factor for the education gap, which I mean, I'm sure there's some truth to, but it doesn't seem like they do any kind of wholesale changes. And they, it's been, it's been all over the map. Well, and 538 the, just might not be the gold standard anymore. I mean, I used yeah. to consider him a, a wizard and now he's wrong like everybody else. Uh, and well, like he's, tri- he's and not a pollster. He, he, I know, I know. He, I know, he aggregates the data. Are, you know, but he's predicting. His, his, his model, stuff. his, his, his model is as good as the inputs. And if the polling gets error, has errors, then the models are going to have errors, right? This is a, I mean, but I, I mean, I think that, and again, it, I think it goes to, um, I did not think that there were more shy Trump voters out there, but apparently there, there were. Um, we were I don't confident know, like, of it. <laughs> What's that? We were confident of it. We knew. Mm-hmm. But anyway, you go, you go. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there were, there were, there were also a lot of shy Biden voters, but, but like, um, you know, and, and we turned our, our folks out, but, um, but I think like, there's clearly like people are either not saying the truth to pollsters or, or outright lying to pollsters, but I don't know. Uh, Lauren, you want to jump in? Yeah, I will say I've, I found this fascinating um, that, you know, I think this kind of election, like one of the things that we've been asking for from the Democratic Party for a very long time is that the Republicans have this way of like of of making things like really clear cut and like making these strong statements that like people can, that are repeatable and like chantable and like all that stuff. And Democrats uh, have been like accused of coming out like more weak sauce than that you know and when i was reading up on the georgia runoff i found like some of the some of the democrats coming out with like really strong statements that i don't think we would have heard four years ago or in any previous elections like i wrote it down because i was like oh damn they're not getting around here they were like say like when they were talking about how much Senator Purdue, they were like, Senator Purdue is a weak scandal plague incumbent who can't defend his record of outsourcing or and corruption. Like that's a sentence that I don't think we would hear a Democrat say uh, it, before this type of election. And now we're coming out with some more s- stronger language. And we are like, I think we're fighting in a different way than we would have fought an election before. I've met Senator Purdue, by the way. He's none of those things. He's a lovely man. <laughs> well, and I'll, but and I'll, I mean, well, if I, if, but you know, I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm talking about the quote. The quote. Like yeah. that's something that I would like. I would imagine yeah. like, uh, you know, a more like quick, yeah. l- like lipped Republican to say as opposed he, to like a Democrat. Yeah. Did, but he also did insider in the insider trading on the COVID stuff, right? It wasn't well, just Loeffler. Like, well, it was Loeffler, like, Loeffler, Burr. Those were the two big ones, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know if the Purdue thing, I never saw anything that really made me go because I was very upset with Burr, who I've also met. Uh, and thought it was a nice dude and Loeffler because those were like direct. They basically left the meeting, went over, said, "Hey, everything's cool, guys," and then went and right. traded uh, in a way that would uh, benefit them. And uh, she's and and that it's she's right on the stock exchange, that, right? Her husband sits on is like the head of the stock exchange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. but and, I, and, I heard that about Purdue. I've never really seen. I haven't had anybody. I don't know. Somebody can send well, me. Well, I mean, sure. you know, and then just like the yeah, like the um, you know, the elongating Riz, is it Rizoff? Is that how you say his last name? Ossoff. Ossoff. Ossoff, sorry. <laughs> I'm conflating two things. It like uh making his nose bigger and like, you know, anti Semite statements, like stuff like that is really fascinating in that particular race, but I, I just say I like I appreciate the big swing because I don't think Democrats are weak. You know, my dad is my greatest example of a of a Democrat. And he's, you know, a ward vet and a firefighter and has seven motorcycles. Like He's a tough dude. And like and he talks that way. And so do all the Democrats in my life. But they you know, uh, but I, so I do I do like to see um, uh, more of, of a charge coming from the Democratic side. 
Well, and I, and I won't spend too much time on this because we need, need to get, keep moving. But I, you know, as we were trying to fill the days, you know, up to the election while we're going over stuff, I saw a, a documentary on, uh, I saw it on Hulu, and it's called Hillbilly. And it's a, uh, you know, feminist um, uh, movie maker who grew up in, in Kentucky who essentially was like looking at, you know, through the lens of Trump just won. This was 2016. Uh, why was her family that kind of used to vote Democrat or used to kind of go back and forth, all of a sudden now they were just all in on uh, on Trump and it, it, and a lot of what they talked about in this in this documentary was how the media and 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 Democrats really talk you know ill about you know people from Appalachia and and stuff like that and and it, it was interesting because watching it it made me uncomfortable thinking yeah you know you you know we like make fun of them and 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 it, and it had a real historical perspective of how. Um, people from Appalachia are treated a lot like African Americans and all these different things to kind of diminish them as far as, you know, what their intelligence level are and that, that they're violent and that they have kids and they don't take care of them, all this stuff. It was super interesting. And I think kind of until Republicans start saying, hey, how's our messaging being being perceived by the females and the suburban uh, people and, and people of color, uh, how are they perceiving? I think Democrats the same way have to, had to put themselves in the positions of these people who they're being, you know, you know, you know, kind of discounted as being, well, too dumb to know what's in their own good, whether that's true or not, they still get to vote. And, you know, are you pushing them further away or bringing them closer in? It was an, it was interesting yeah. to me. But. I mean, yeah, and I, I think there are lots of lessons that each party can take from this election. Um, some and some very good and some very bad um, that that each side would would. I think needs to, to think about both in like we think about Minnesota and nationally. I, I mean, I think, you know, when you look at, it's not, it's not a sustainable problem. I'd say that, you know, for, for Republicans nationally to have like seven of the last eight elections, um, Republicans have lost the popular vote um, of presidential elections. And that, uh, and, and, and now what we're seeing in Georgia um, being in, in uh, at this, this time, like, that's also that the lesson for us is um, is organizing, right? Mm-hmm. That there has been uh, like Georgia Democrats had given up on Georgia, and Stacey Abrams just refused to like. I, I mean, I I listened to her speak like she just like would speak wherever Democrats came together and make the case for the number of black voters and yeah. black Latino Asian voters in the state of Georgia because the state is much more diverse than people uh, r- r- recognize. Um, and they're there to be got to be to be tapped into, and they're the demographics of Texas are also um, uh, dramatically like when you look at the voting eligible as opposed to voting voting registered or or people who actually vote. There's big chasms there, and so for Democrats, it's about paying attention to 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 to, to that and organizing. But like the with those demographics and with like a, a, a South a Democratic South rising potentially, like that's. That doll is also potentially deadly for for Republicans. Well, well, right. I was just going to say, but also Republicans could have an opportunity there. If you saw what happened in Miami Dade uh, with the Cuban vote, um, Republicans and Donald Trump in particular did very, very well. Um, and so, if you know, from a Republican standpoint, they have a couple they have a couple fields that really haven't changed, by the way, from several cycles for Republicans. And I would say nationally, we have struggled, Javier, and we have also struggled statewide. We've not won a statewide race since 2006, uh, Governor Tim Pawlenty. And if you look at the chart on Washington County, Dakota County, Scott County, Carver County, the seven county metro area, I mean, from 2002 to now, it is just a straight downward trajectory. There's like a little bounce here at the end in Carver and Scott County. But it's almost entirely a straight to the bottom uh, suburban vote for Republicans. And we are never, ever going to win statewide if we don't have someone that can win in the suburbs. Just straight out and pick up some 
of the min- of the of the minority vote. We just aren't. We're you're never going to get it. And I hear a lot of people saying, "Oh, well, what about this state is so blue and this the it 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 wasn't and it doesn't have to be. It's like I feel like when in 2010 when I was like doing the Senate elections and no one would believe me we could win and I just looked around and goes, "There's there's no reason the Republicans can't win here. There's absolutely positively no reason except that we are leaving votes on the table and that we are picking candidates that cannot pick up those votes or and, and, the- and messages that don't." And the flip side of that, right, is that the uh, for our side is that it is increasing. It is becoming increasingly difficult for us to win a majority it's in the in the legislature. Our lasting majorities in the legislature, we win in waves and then we lose. And yeah. and like and so are, are the population not being are the population of Democrats not being like. Uh, spread out uh, uh, enough, essentially being very very concentrated, and so this is something I think that that all sides need to really imbibe and take into a, into account. Well, uh, I don't have more to say on Latino vote in Florida and might spank. Yeah, I didn't. Okay, want to well, well, you, I did not know, want to your thunder. I, I was just going to talk about that, so I, I will hold off because I know Javier and I actually agree on this a little bit. But you know what we learned was is the Republicans found a way to message to. Cuban voters, I wouldn't say necessarily we figured out a message to Latino voters, but anyway, I'll, I, I'll, I will save that for his, for his spank. Where where are we on the run sheet? I don't, I don't even know. Yeah. It's been just so yeah, crazy. we've gone we've gone all over. We sort of went. This is why we're not happened. sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. We went, we went like the week. Uh, we well, it's hard. It's hard to focus because there's so much to it. There's yeah, so, so much, much nuance it's, in like every it's, race. It's, I feel like uh, yeah. Senator Fishbach. Should we go? Should we talk about our predictions? Senator Fishbach absolutely oh, won yeah. CD seven. That so now it is a four and four count. Four Republicans, four Democrats. Everything else stayed the same uh, except it finally happened. Colin Peterson. I don't. I think we all predicted that last week. Lola, you weren't here. I'm sure you would have too. Um, it just it felt like it was finally time for the last of the blue dogs to lose a seat. The Senator Fish, uh, former Senator Fishbach, now Congresswoman elect. Um, was a very good candidate. She ran a very good race. It was very strong. It was flawless. Uh, it was re- she. They worked really hard on that team, and um, she is now going to Congress. And that one just feels like it had to happen. That it was, was that was going to happen. Hagedorn, Hagedorn. I did not predict Hagedorn winning. I thought it was going to be another razor thin um, um, win in the CD one. I thought the Feehan would win, <laughs> but um, but. Um, but um, you know, uh, Hag- Hagedorn, another- Hagedorn increased uh, his uh, his his lead, and and that is is you know certainly something for Hagedorn to be proud of. But what it showed was is that um, as many I had lots of friends from that area I went to college down on the first who were telling me, well, the farmers are all mad, the farmers are all mad, and I just didn't necessarily believe that. And this shows that whatever Trump was doing, good, bad, or indifferent, it wasn't being you know attached to Hagedorn. Right. Yeah. No. That and the he benefited from Hagedorn benefited from again. You know the increased turnout on both sides, and it's a generally Republican district. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So so yeah, it's. Uh, it, uh, what kind of surprised me, I don't know about anybody else, but con- considering, okay, so two things, CD3, which just last time was won by Dean Phillips over incumbent Eric Paulson, that has been a long time Republican stronghold that's been trending swing. Dean Phillips uh, finally picked it up last time around. It wasn't even close this time. It was just a blowout. So CD3 seems lost and gone, but CD2 was a lot closer than I thought it was going to be. I think we picked Angie Craig, all of us, um, but Tyler Kistner really uh, gave her a run for her money on that. And it also it suffered from the Dakota County. I mean, for a long time he was up from the Dakota County. Oh my gosh. Yeah, but, but also just in general, that race was a lot closer than I thought it would be. I it, don't know. It was close. You know what's funny about the Dean Phillips thing is like, for some reason, like I was, I felt emboldened to camp Campaign for Dean Phillips when I have like nothing to do with that district. I just felt like I'm going to get in here and I'm going to write some postcards. Well, <laughs> and so I wonder if that's, I wonder if that's the case, you know, like more people have more time on the, their hands and they were like uh, more active than they would have been had, you know, cause I was surprised about the Craig thing as well. Well, and, and I think, you know, kind of going back to the third, um, I think that the third was a was a you know moderate Republican district, and that was a credit to and this I'll, I'll telegraph my thank mm-hmm. to Jim Ramstead, and then Eric Paulson was able to go in there, even though he was more conservative. He had a very 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 strong link uh, to Jim Ramstead. In fact, Eric Paulson yeah. was my boss um, when I uh, interned for for Jim Ramstead, and then once that Ramstead link was gone, um, you know, it, as much as Kendall Qualls is somebody who I think people see 
there's a there's a lot to like there. That district is just gonna be super hard for uh, somebody to win in the second down in you know where I live, the Angie Craig and the um, and the Tyler Kistner race. One of the things that kind of made me angry election night um, was you know Kistner was up and then Craig was up and I I could have absolutely believed either result, um, but I don't like that there were. I don't even know what the exact number was, but there were ten or twenty thousand votes for the dead guy, and maybe all twenty thousand votes of those would have gone to Angie Craig. Maybe they would have gone to Kistner, or they would have been divided in between. But um, for anyone, and I know that this is something that we had a state, we had we had uh, Secretary of State Steve Simon on last week. We had a state law that would have pushed that to uh, February. It got trumped by by federal law, and I get that. That's fine. But when I see people voting, and I know people that voted intentionally for the dead guy, that tells me that that dead guy should not have been on um, mm-hmm. on the, that ballot, and it would have potentially changed who represents that district. Maybe not, but I think I think it was the wrong call, and that's just world according to Brian. I have, a, I have a question for you guys about Minnesota in, in general. Um, w- you know, there's like – there was a couple articles about, um, you know, the the legalized marijuana party, like pulling votes and like actually like not necessarily winning, but pulling significant amount of votes from people that would be generally voting more blue or more democratic. Do you think that's an actual thing or is that just something that people like to say? Well, it's an actual it's an actual thing. And sometimes it happens naturally, like nobody. I mean, I, Sometimes it happens naturally where a third party just, you know, with without the intention of saying, I'm here to help the Republican or I'm here to help the Democrat. Sometimes there are legit third parties. And then yeah. in, in the second congressional district years ago, you know, the Democrats ran a Democrat under the no new taxes party. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, obviously trying to get Republicans. And then there there are, are claims that the, that Mr. Weeks, who passed away um, in the second congressional district, that he was put up by Republicans to do that. Um, it happens. Paul Dezelka recruited yeah, uh, three I mean, Senate candidates. It's, it's, or, I mean, it's, it, 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 it happens. It's not cool. Um, I don't like that as a as a as a small D Democrat or as a political science nerd. Um, but you know, there's all kinds of strategy um, that goes into these things. I remember a few years ago, maybe ten years ago, in Wright County and surrounding conservative areas, there was a Constitution Party that propped up, and it was taking, and it was a, it was just a natural occurring third party of like kind of really conservative Republicans, uh, and they obviously were taking votes from the Republican Party. So it just it can happen, and frankly that's how the two weed parties got major party status is they were just ran because legal legalization was a, is a big issue um and they got major party status last time around because they got over what is it over five percent in the statewide races both two parties did so, right yeah 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 but um yeah, so so the uh, so actually we we uh, talked about CD three, and I think that's a nice transition for us to um, just recognize and honor um, the passing of uh, Congressman former Congressman Jim Ramstad. Um, Amy and Brian, you both uh, knew him, um, and uh, he was you know he was, he was, the, he was the, the former Congressman before Eric Paulson of, of the third district. And he was a really good friend of Paul Wellstone's. That's what I remember about him. They worked together on, on issues of mental health and he was, and, and he's really feels like a politician of a different, of a very, very different era of like working across aisles and being just very decent in many ways, but uh, I know you guys know him personally. So yeah. Yeah. And this, this memories. was going to be, this was going to be my, my, my thank, but I'm, I'm happy to, I'll just do it now and then, and then won't do it later. But yeah, Jim Ramstead is an incredibly important person in my life. When I was in junior high, I got to, and he was in the state Senate. I got to job shadow him and um, you know, he was just could not have spent more time with you know, a bunch of kids. I wasn't even from his district and he spent a ton of time with me. Um, and then when I got into college, I ended up getting an internship uh, with him and uh, his district director at the time was Eric Paulson, who was running for the Minnesota House of Representatives. So I would work for Jim during the day, and then we would go and we would we would campaign with Eric uh, afterwards. So then when Eric went to the legislature, ultimately then when I wanted to go and 
and become staff. I had made those connections. Jim Ramstead, who who ended up suffering um, from lots of lots of debilitating uh, injuries, uh, uh, illnesses. That you know, is it, when when he was on his game, he remembered you. He remembered your name. He remembered um, you know what you uh, did for him. And he was you know he was just a very fiscally conservative, socially moderate um, person back when those things were allowed. And while I didn't, oh, I mean, I would consider myself much more conservative than him, but I learned so much working for him about how he treated people, how he treated staff. He was a recovering alcoholic. I worked for him in 1994, where he broke from Republicans to vote with um, Bill Clinton on the crime bill, which banned a ton of guns, which now I understood not at all then, and I understand a lot more about the politics of it now, um, but I spent that whole summer uh, just taking phone calls from angry people, and I know that that weighed on uh, Jim a ton, um, but he also had language in that bill, um, the Jacob Wetterling language what was his and was in that bill, and he was willing to take a difficult vote that he knew he was going to get his ass handed to him on um, for something else that he saw was right. And the people at the Minnesota State Capitol and working in D see that kind of like are are you know fruit from the Jim Ramstead tree they're good people they are the people that you want um, you know in charge of things from the Republican side and um, and uh, so I, I knew he, I knew he'd been very ill um, he was 74 I'm sorry for his passing but uh, his legacy uh, lives on through all of us that got our start with him there's no way that this podcast would exist but for Jim Ramstead, because ha- I would never be in politics. Javier and, I, Javier and I never would have met, and he would be on this show um, with less cool people. <laughs> or just Amy. No. <laughs> less, less cool. No. Less cool. Uh, so my experience with Jim Ramstead is completely different, because I was not one of the college Republicans. I came to politics, uh, well, relatively late in life. I was uh, in my early 30s and I ran for office. I, I was involved with my local BPOU and then I ran for uh, state senate and I won. Uh, I think I was 32 or something. Um, and so I actually never knew Jim. He I was not in his district um, and we'd never met. And even uh, as I kind of climbed in public Republican politics and, and became majority leader, I still Never met Jim Ramstead. Obviously, I knew who he was. He had all kinds of folks like Brian that had come from Jim Ramstead's, like, kind of, you know, his staff uh, and had grown up. And and they were a tight group. And I drove through his district on the way home. So I saw his big orange and uh, black uh, campaign signs all the time. But I didn't really know him. I knew that he was a good guy. That's all I knew and that I knew he was very, um, like, worked across the aisle. And so um, how I got to know Jim was very, very personal. Uh, When I was um, going through uh, my terrible time, which is when, so my scandal had broken and I was, this was, um, it broke the end of December. There was a big press conference um, and uh, probably mid-January, I was getting mail and I won't say this was the, he was the only one because there were some lovely people that had sent me cards and notes of encouragement, people that would, you know, probably surprise some, right? It was uh, Margaret Anderson Keller, her sent lovely and Stanley Hubbard. And I got calls from Amy Klobuchar and I got calls from Eric Paulson. Um, Mm -hmm. So it was a real mix, but there came in the mail um, a letter. uh, It was, um, it was like a, like a big thick envelope um, and addressed to me. And it was, I opened it and it was a three page handwritten letter uh, and it started with you know I think it, I'm gonna get the date quite wrong but it was July 5th 1981 I woke up on the floor of a jail cell in North Dakota mm. um, barely sober you know still still drunk um, I had torn up a, 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 a hotel room and wound up in jail I didn't know his story um, and he and he went on and detailed that and he talked about the pain and he talked about um, coming back from that and and like reconciliation with yourself and your family and and your constituency and he talked about pain and he he was talking so directly to me it was it was it was hard to read so many people had given me very lovely things but no one can understand what it's like to have your super personal pain 
brought into a public light like that unless it has happened to you. Everyone can imagine, because people have gone through divorces and people have struggles, but to have it on the 6 o'clock news for night after night after night, it takes a very special person. And he 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 like outlined it in this letter so clearly, and then he just said, let's get together. And so we went and we had lunch. Again, first time I had ever spent any amount of time with him and we cried and he talked about my future and he told me it was going to be okay which I never believed um and he asked me it was was beginning of January and I had kind of said that I wouldn't run but I'd asked um, like Bruce Anderson and stuff just hold off before you announce because I you know I'm not sure um and Jim talked about me running and he said you know I was worried about like standing in front of my Republicans and being judged and he said I will stand on the stage with you. And I said, well, it's Wright County and you're a rhino, so you can't. <laughs> no, that's not what I said. Um, I just didn't. I really didn't think I was worth it. Um, but that never, ever, ever came to his mind. He would have absolutely done that had I run. Um, and then, you know, we, within, within a couple of weeks of that, uh, my mom was, you know, terminal brain cancer and and actually then bruce did announce he was going to run and the, the door was totally closed on that part of my career um and and i was you know divorcing and all the things piled up and my time with jim was very like just that year right and it was just as i needed him he was like an angel and i didn't even we didn't even have like lots of conversations but he was always there for me to text he was always at the ready for me and i knew he was there and it was the first time because i could because I knew he really understood what I was going through that I finally believed because people would say to me, oh, Amy, it's fine. We love you. And and we don't care what happened. And 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 I would think uh, they're just being nice. But when Jim Ramsey said to me that it was going to be OK, there was the first time like, I allowed myself to hope that it would be. <laughs> so he gave that to me and I want his family to know because they, he probably never told them. Maybe he didn't even realize how important he was to me. But I think I'm probably here because of him. <laughs> So, um, yeah. So thank you, Jim Ramstead and rest in peace. And yeah, I can never, I can never say thank you enough. Thank you guys both for sharing those stories with me. Like these are, they're beautiful tributes to a, um, a man. I wish I would have known just from what you've said. So thank you for sharing that today. I loved, I loved hearing that. I'm sure his family will too. All right, so we go to, uh, does anyone have any plugs? Well, Javier, you and I are on Almanac tonight. Yes, we are on Almanac tonight. Yeah, yes. how about that? So that's one. And so you can watch at 7 o'clock on TPT or over the weekend um, and streaming online, of course. So we will, it's a panel of two as, they, as we do now during COVID. But are Brian, you, are, you got are, anything? Are you, are you live or are you Zoom? Resume. Okay. Resume. Uh, well, Amy, pandemic's and I, not over. Pandemic's not over. Unlike what Trump told you, the election happened and the pandemic is still here. Well, <laughs> Brian is taking it very seriously. It, you guys it, feel it, loosey goosey about yeah, it. It's, it's, <laughs> it's super dangerous. Yeah. yeah. Next next week, like Lauren and I should be in studio, and you guys yeah. Yeah. In, <laughs> like Zoom, but like and in hazmat suits. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no. Hey, everybody. Everybody. Live your lives, wear your masks, keep businesses open. Um, but uh, but um, so Amy and I, every Monday, uh, we're on the Bob's Chance of Your Show, so I'm sure we'll be talking uh, politics there. But then on Sunday, uh, I'm going to be on At Issue with um, uh, Tom Hauser, and uh, my uh, DFL counterpart will be uh, Senator Jeff Hayden making his debut on the, uh, uh, on the At Issue program. Wow. Oh, excellent. Lolo? Um, Lauren, you got anything to plug? I don't have anything uh, necessarily, but you can always follow me on Instagram at Tramp Nation Seven. It is my, it is an entire Instagram page dedicated to trampoline pictures. That even in these uncertain and anxious times, it will make you feel better. <laughs> That's it. That's all. And and a note on that, we have we have this ongoing conversation, Lauren and I, about this because I I like. I can't believe the number of people who have joined Tramp Nation because of Wrong About Everything. Um, and that's lovely. That's cool. I just hope you're also going to our Patreon page. Yeah, most of Patreon. them are Tramp Nation. Most of them yes. are following so, both, which they should be. So Julia Eagles is our election week. Not a dick. Thank you, Julia. I mean, even in the middle of a busy election week, Julia thought of us. 
I wow. know, right? She's wow. especially. She's more than not a dick. She's awesome. Yep. Thank you. And a multitasking, not a dick. Chicken clam for that. A, exactly. Multitasking. That was, yes. So thank you very much for the rest of you. Patreon.com slash wrong about everything podcast. Um, you won't be as awesome as Julia who thought of us during election week. We know, you know, it's a busy week for everyone. So you have a little bit of a reprieve, but as of uh, say uh, tomorrow, no longer you're listening to the show. Could you spare a couple of bucks? Cause I think you can, we all think you can. We know lots of you. Yeah. And we see you download us. Yeah. So <laughs> throw a few bucks. All right. Would it kill you? No, it wouldn't kill you. That's the answer. It would not kill you. So just don't be a dick. I'm like COVID. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I like this i like this new track i yeah. think you should stay yeah. on it oh. <laughs> you i don't know where, your republicans to follow i don't know where you i don't know where y'all have been on this <laughs> yeah brian's all of a sudden like uh i have comorbidities i am diabetic eh. <laughs> eh. get that get that shit away from me yes. wear your mask so. keep businesses open all right uh and as always um, we appreciate all your business yeah yeah yeah, yeah. don't be a dick <laughs> Sp uh, Spanks and thanks. Who wants to go first? Uh, I can go. Um, so I'll just do a very, uh, so I'll do a very short thank because I did my, 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 uh, my uh, Ramstead thank, but uh, I'm going to thank uh, Majority Leader uh, Paul Gazelka. Uh, speaker Melissa Hortman and now minority leaders Kurt Doubt he did he did uh, just get elected by his caucus to be minority leader in the house and Susan Kent uh, we're keeping the same we're keeping the band back to get we're getting the band back together so all four leaders from last year will be able to continue uh, in their role so I thank them uh, for their service because uh, I'll enjoy actually working with all of them um, my spank is going to be to Minnesota GOP uh, uh, party chairwoman Jennifer Carnahan and this is something that happened a little while ago, but it's something that uh, that uh, is now gaining steam um, where um, Jennifer Carnahan uh, essentially anointed as party chair. Uh, my pillow dude, uh, Lindell, Mike Lindell, is that his name? Mike Lindell. Mike Lindell to be the presumptive nominee uh, for governor uh, in Minnesota in 2022. And uh, I just want to make sure that I say hell no, no. <laughs> One, not it, just not, not just that. Her as lieutenant governor. Well, and that's now that's what's being talked about is that she there's some sort of side deal, and I don't know if that's true or not. But hell no. Uh, the Mike pillow, the Mike pillow guy. One pillow, pillow suck. They suck, and <laughs> it is not her job to pick who who is going to be the uh, no, the uh, nominee. Uh, certainly not some outsider, who, some Johnny come lately who has done nothing for uh, for the party in his time, other than kind of like weasel his way in and try to get um, attention from it, and and you know p pucker his ass up to to President Trump. Um, no, this <laughs> definitely if if all the other stuff didn't make me do it, this definitely makes me question what the hell she's doing as a state party chair because this is re goddamn ridiculous and one i can tell you not only is do i do i think it shouldn't happen there is no way it's gonna happen and <laughs> i am pissed as hell about it and if any republican wants to wants to tweet at me about this you're dumb so i'm <laughs> spanking jennifer carnahan i'm spanking mike lindell for his stupid ass pillows um and uh mcdaniel out so two things remember a couple weeks few weeks ago when i kept saying she ain't right and you guys were looking at me like i was crossing a line <laughs> jennifer carnahan ain't right she ain't right but did you did you see and the second thing i want to say did you see karen Maratz's awesome hashtag about mike lindell no no hashtag pillow sham I did. I did. I did. I did. Oh, that woman. That woman. I did see that. That woman. Yes. So if the please. delegates want to pick him, fine. They're dumb, but they're fine. But she and doesn't like, get to pick it. And why didn't and she? And she's like, supposed she to stay quiet. Herself for governor and him is. You know what I mean? But you don't get to do any of that as party chair. Your yeah, whole job of party chair is to make sure that the that the process is fair and takes place like in in a in a in in, in a controlled and fair way. That's it. That's I your know, whole job. You in fact you're don't pick an illegal swing like that. Like she right. might as well put herself in the governor's well, step seat. down and have run. You, step down and run. Don't tweet at me. Have for you money. seen have you followed her on Twitter there, Lauren? 
Oh, it's hell amusing no. <laughs> because three, four times a day, she tweets something that she a few minutes later has to delete because it's like, like, you know, uh, accidentally bananas. Um, uh, like all the time, all, her Twitter feed, she should have an auto delete on it. Cause she should it, hand her phone to can one you of do her like colleagues. Snapchat for Twitter where it just yeah. like, it goes up for a little while, then it's gone forever <laughs> and if somebody <laughs> screenshots it it lets you know <laughs> that would be you can you snapchat. invent that twitter i'm just getting yeah. madder and madder somebody else do yours okay i'm just gonna be mad. Right. okay i'll Go just on. do it i'll do a double oh. thank it's gonna be a simple okay. double thank because it is election and it is um so my thank is for all the republican candidates and my thank is for all the democrat candidates um because it is really really difficult um and is getting more and more difficult with social Social media and everyone is in such a divided way to put your name on the ballot um, and we we need good people to run for office and so um, I'm always continually amazed uh, at some of the like quality people that step forward and put their name out to be you know lambasted and it's it's nerve-wracking to have your name on the ballot and have all thousands tens of thousands of people judging you that don't even know you i remember losing vote, coats and votes and thinking well why don't they like me have I, they haven't even met me um and I, so I, I can tell them. all right <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, so it is It is a big move to do that. We need great leadership. I, of course, am particular about women getting uh, running uh, for office. We are still underrepresented, ladies, uh, about 25 to 30 percent of state legislature legislatures um, ministers a little on the high end at 24 or 25 it's not enough we're 50 percent of the population get out there run for office uh and support your candidates um so that is my thank for everybody that has the guts to put your name on a ballot lauren um well speaking of people who have have guts i just have a thank this week and this my thank goes out to a man named ernie chambers who is part of the uh legislation uh he was a legislator uh is a legislator he's the only legislator uh in nebraska to have been like termed out twice so he ran from 1971 to 2009 and then he ran again from 2013 to the present day which is insane he's been a reelected 11 times and why this guy is such a badass not only did he like he he um he's like known for um uh he's black man and he's known for wearing cut off sweatshirts <laughs> like short sleeve sh sweatshirts and uh he's a uh, like a no nonsense kind of guy that's been um very progressive in a traditionally kind of red state or mostly red state um he's come out for equal pensions for women uh to get rid of corporal punishment in schools um and he has consecutive or continuously attempted to end the death penalty there and what I'm learning about when I did all this research, so I wouldn't sound like a dummy when I came on the podcast today, is I learned that Nebraska is unicameral, meaning that they can split their electoral votes, which I didn't even know was a possibility. And it, it all kind of boils down to this one guy named Ernie Cham uh, Ernie Chambers, who would fill who has filibustered in his cutoff short uh, sweatshirts um, to keep that that state uh, unicameral. Um, um, so, and, and if we had lost Pennsylvania, that one electoral vote from Nebraska would have helped the Democrats, like it would have helped Biden, like win the election, supposedly. So I just, I just thought, you know, earlier Brian was talking about how people, you know, they get so dazzled by the presidential race when really our state side races impact us more. And a person like Ernie Chambers is freaking awesome. This is a guy who just, who just like knows how to run and get things done. And, uh, and, and I, I, for one, love a cutoff sweatshirt. So <laughs> there's that aspect of it too, but talk about, I want to thank him for all of his work and all of his service to his state. Um, and I want to thank all the people that continuously voted him in for so, so 11 times. I mean, that's insane um, because his one, one man made all the difference there or could make all the difference in a presidential election. So thank you, Ernie Chambers. And thank you to those like you because um, one person can make a difference. Votes do count. 
Uh, I have uh, double spank. My, well, it's one spank. It's bad takes. Uh, <laughs> one national, one Minnesota. Uh, first, it takes on the Latino vote. Anyone who's observed the Latino vote over the years is not surprised to learn that about 30% of Latino vote can and has gone to Republicans. Part of the reason is because there is no such thing as a Latino vote. Um, <laughs> Latino is a category that we use to subsume lots of different uh, ethnicities and, and, and groups of national from different national origins. And it plays out differently in different states, right? And, um, and so, especially in the state of Florida, people do not identify as Latinos. People identify as Cubans, Puerto Ricans, Colombians, or, uh, Venezuelans. And if you have a two-dimensional understanding of the Latino community and you think that, well, surely they're all appalled by, uh, by children's in, uh, children in cages. Well, a lot of the Latino community, people who are Spanish speakers of Latin American origin in Florida are uh, people who in their home countries would identify and probably here identify as white um, and who do not at all identify with Central American refugees and uh, may very well not give a rat's ass about children's in ca children in cages the way, sadly, many Americans seem to not care about children in cages. Um, and so it's a very complex electorate. But, but from my party side, when you have a two-dimensional understanding and then think that you don't actually have to fight for every vote in a very specific way, because the fact that we did not for have a drumbeat in Florida, just pointing out all the ways in which Donald Trump represents all of the strong men that Latin Americans who have fled and are living as refugees in Florida, like whether it's uh, uh, Daniel Ortega in, uh, in Nicaragua, the people who do not, like, there are many Venezuelans um, uh, who have fled Maduro uh, and, and, uh, and, and Chavez and Chavismo in Venezuela. Um, so whether we like, you know, what, like, and, and there are people on the left here who are fans of, uh, uh, of, the, of those folks, but you know what, the people in Florida who are Venezuelans, they're not fans of them. So you just got, you, you either got to meet people where they are or figure it out or try to figure out a way to convince them. But it starts by understand by having a complex understanding. And yes, there are parts of the country, especially like in Texas, where, where Mexican Americans seem to have voted for, um, uh, for Trump. When you look at the difference between, uh, that those areas of Texas and Arizona, you know what the difference is? It's investment in organizing and infrastructure. The, the, the dreamers in Arizona are my fucking heroes. I love them so damn much. They, they founded organizations like Lucha um, uh, and uh, another group called Poder who have been working. And you remember years ago when it was out of nowhere, suddenly Sheriff Arpaio was defeated mm -hmm. um, and everyone was like, what the hell? Because Maricopa County seemed like the center. It was the center of like really racist, anti-immigrant rhetoric and policies and everything. And that was the work of those young people who are now slightly older and have been working their freaking asses off. And that's what it takes is organizing. Is organizing and so my party needs to learn to tell the difference between a puerto rican a cuban a colombian and uh and uh, a mexican um and the difference between a black puerto rican and and uh, it, it, like we are a complex people um and by the way our community needs to deal with its own anti-blackness because a lot of what happened in florida too was we were so worried about the the re reaction of the suburbs of the white suburbs to the racial uprisings of this last summer you know where there was a real backlash was amongst a lot of latino voters mm -hmm. of a lot of different groups uh in florida and there was massive disinformation um, and misinformation. I was, I was, had read up on this and got so uh, alarmed. I was doing texting into Florida and I, I read the text back from people, the things that, that they were spewing back and conspiracy theories. And uh, it, it's, it was bananas down there. And that's what happened because we let, um, uh, we assumed we knew we had a two dimensional understanding of what Latinos there were. So that's first bad take. Second bad take is Minnesota. So Congresswoman Omar is, um, is a Im very important leader in the Democratic Party for progressives, especially, and has her personal story and her passion uh, play an important role in our party's politics right now, without a doubt. Like her or not, that is without a doubt. However, um, 
it is a leap from that that some people make that are uh, that um, Dave Weigel of the Washington Post like um, tailed uh, her, her the final weekend on um, uh, door knocking and then he made claims and the congresswoman's campaign made claims that she increased turnout in CD five um, and that that her work uh, won the state for Biden. Um, uh, and and Dave Weigel and others and, and there's another national reporter who tweeted something like that today and 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 there's one thing you could do you could just look at at actual numbers um, and in CD five uh, um, Joe Biden got seventy three thousand more votes than Ilhan Omar did um, and Tina Smith got forty thousand more votes than um, than Ilhan Omar did, Omar did. Um, and she underperformed her own her, her like in twenty in twenty twenty. Um, there were a hundred thousand more votes in CD five than in um, than in uh, twenty eighteen, but she got twelve thousand fewer votes than she did two years ago. Um, I say this not to slam her, not to like we're all free to love people. That's for what they are, but let's not make up stuff about what they are not. And why it's particularly important to me is because the numbers that we have had in CD five are the reason why. What we were talking about earlier, why Republicans can't win statewide, because we have been and 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 who built that turnout machine was Keith Ellison by having a permanent campaign infrastructure 24 seven all year round. And that that canvas that um, that that Dave Weigel followed around was a paid canvas, mm -hmm. and which is great. But that's different than a, than a vol than an operation that is staffed and where you recruit people and you generate excitement and you actually actually do increase turnout. So let's just. The lesson for us, again, organizing works, Democrats, so let's do it, and let's not pretend we're doing it while we're not. And with that, <laughs> anyone else? Sorry, I think oh, we're done, right? No. Yeah, <laughs> that was it. Yeah, <laughs> with that, I am uh, declaring, what is? what did Trump say about the states? I am claiming all 50 states as mine, Javier Morillo. Uh, I am about to stage a runoff to the bathroom, Lauren Anderson. <laughs> Yikes. Um, I uh, want to make sure everyone's heard about this COVID thing and encourage everyone to wear your masks and so we can keep schools and uh, restaurants and bars and uh, stores open. Brian and, I, and I'll be heading to Las Vegas to help with that count. Amy Coke. <laughs> and we are wrong about, about everything. everything. Wait for me, Vegas. Yeah, the only count you're going to help with is on Blackjack. <laughs> or a crap stable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you think they'd be better at counting. Seven, <laughs> eleven. <laughs> <laughs>